Thank you, Vanya. And I want to thank uh, everyone for just the wonderful hospitality I've had during my stay here in Brazil. It's really been an honor to, to spend time in your beautiful country, first at the Congress and now here in uh, Sao Carlos. Um, obviously, I don't speak Portuguese. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and so I will try to speak my English as clearly uh, as possible. But if there's something you don't understand, please feel free to ask me questions or slow me down or stop me. And also, as I'm talking, um, if you have a question or a comment that you'd like to share, don't feel like you have to wait to the end of the talk. You can ask questions as we go along. So that'll, that'll help you stay awake, too. <laughs> So what I really want to focus on, most of my talk this morning is going to really look at green chemistry's role in achieving sustainability. But um, I, I wanted to give a little bit of background information because I don't think everyone here was at the Congress this week. Is that right? Okay. H how many people were at the Congress this week? Okay. So. So a little background is going to be useful. Excellent. OK. So it's important to start with, I think, definitions so we have a common understanding of what we mean by green chemistry and sustainability. So this is sort of the standard definition that was articulated by Paul Anastas and John Warner back in about 1998. And they define green chemistry as the design of chemical products and processes that reduce or eliminate the use and generation of hazardous substances. There's a couple key things to focus on, and one is that word design. It is really looking at what you're doing in terms of chemistry and making a conscious decision to try to do it in a way that's better for human health and the environment. When we look at hazardous substances, we don't just mean things that you would you know, open in the lab and take a whiff of and you drop dead on the floor. Um, we need things that are, are hazardous in a much broader sense, things that contribute to global climate change, for example, or ozone depletion. Those are also hazards, but on a much longer time scale than something that's acutely toxic. So these are sort of the key features of green chemistry in terms of its definition. And how many of you are familiar with the 12 principles of green chemistry? How many of you have seen these before? Come on, if you were at the Congress, you should have seen these. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> these, these showed up in a lot of talks at the Congress. And these are guidelines. This is sort of the short version of them. And many of them are common sense. You know, prevention. It's better to prevent waste than to clean it up after it's been created. You know, that just makes common sense. If you don't create a mess, then you don't have to deal with it afterwards. Atom economy trying to get as many of the atoms in your starting material into the final product. Because if they're not going into the final product, they're going into the waste stream. And then you've got to go back to principle one and clean it up. Designing less hazardous chemical syntheses and designing safer chemicals. Can we carry out a transformation using a, a chemical or reagent that is going to be less hazardous, for example, or create less waste? Solvents. I'm an organic chemist. I love solvents. But organic solvents have a lot of problems with them. You know, they're volatile organics. They contribute to air pollution. Um, many of them are hazardous in and of themselves. They can cause cancer. They can be toxic. So we want to minimize the use of these hazardous solvents as much as possible. Energy efficiency. We've only got a finite amount of energy on the planet, especially with fossil fuels. We need to do a better job with renewables. But in the meantime, we need to try to design our processes so that we can run them at room temperature and atmospheric pressure rather than high temperatures and pressures. Renewable feedstocks, I predict everyone in this room being from Brazil could, could tell me a lot about renewables because that's one of the things you're best known for. Reducing our derivatives. Think about when you're carrying, so how many people are organic chemists in this room? How many people have taken organic chemistry in this room? No one has taken organic chemistry? Who had a course in organic chemistry or a class? Ah, there we go. Yes, I'm just not saying it right. Who had a class in organic chemistry? So you know that oftentimes you've got complex molecules. And you've got to um, protect one group while you carry out a transformation on another group. 
But each time you do that, you've got to add two more steps. <coughs> and that's more energy and more solvent. And so you want to reduce that as much as possible. Catalysts. What's so good about using a catalyst? Why do we use catalysts? What do they do? Uh, we work with some soft catalysts. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we define and uh, modify catalysts for, for whatever different conditions of the action and all of that. Right, so you can get, make very selective catalysts for particular reactions. Oftentimes, the catalysts, in addition to giving you selectivity, can decrease your energy requirements, too. And so that's also a benefit. Um, design for degradation. Right now, we make materials and products that last forever. We don't use them forever. And so what we need to do is design our products so that they will degrade into harmless compounds at the end of their useful lifetime. Sometimes things degrade into more harmful compounds, and that's not a good thing. Um, we need to have better analytical techniques. This is principle 11, so that we can monitor processes as they're taking place, minimize energy use, minimize solvent usage, minimize byproduct formation. And then finally, inherently safer chemistry. Let's not use things that catch fire or blow up. <laughs> it's, it's going to be much safer if we're using things that don't have that potential or possibility. So these are, that's a very quick overview of the 12 principles of green chemistry. So how does green chemistry now fit into sustainability or sustainable development? And so the Brundtland Commission has defined sustainable development as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So in other words, we shouldn't be using up all the resources for ourselves. We need to think about our children and grandchildren. I have an eight-month-old grandson. He's so cute. I want him to have a wonderful planet to live on. I don't want it to be full of all the pollution and waste that we've created. And so green chemistry can really play a big role in achieving sustainability. Because think about it. We're at seven billion people on the planet right now. That number is increasing. And as our quality of life improves, those 7 billion people are going to want more and more of the wonderful consumer products we all have. And it's going to be hard to change people's behavior patterns. So what can we as chemists do? We can design all of those consumer products in a way that's better for the planet and, for, and better for human health. So that's where the chemistry really comes in, in achieving sustainability. Now, one of the challenges, though, is a lot of people are not familiar, not just with green chemistry, but, but also their role in achieving sustainability. You know, how do we, as a single person, work towards sustainability? One of the things the United Nations has done is they've recognized that educating everybody about sustainability is very important. So instead of designating an international year, you know, last year was the International Year of Chemistry, the UN designated an entire decade, because this is a big job, educating people about sustainability. And what they want to do is try to make sure as many people as possible, particularly students, understand the practices of sustainable development so that we can all collectively, all seven billion of us, try to make sure that we develop, that we leave our, our children and grandchildren with a sustainable world. And these are the three pillars of sustainability. We've got a flourishing environment, we've got social health, and a viable economy. And the intersection in the middle of those three pillars of sustainability is where we're going to find a sustainable society. One of the goals of this decade of education for sustainable uh, development is to make sure, and you can see this here, that people develop the knowledge, values, and skills to participate in decisions. This isn't just for the chemists and the chemical engineers. This is for everyone, because no matter who you are, you have to make decisions that have a sustainability component to them. When you go to the store and purchase things, you have choices. When there's an election, 
when you're going in and voting on various issues, you have choices. And understanding sustainability is going to help you make those choices in a way that's going to be better for the planet. Okay, any questions though thus far? Is this making sense? Yes? Okay. <laughs> but again, stop me if you have questions or comments. This, go this decade of education for sustainability really ties in with the UN's Millennium Goals. And you can see these goals here. They're very ambitious, you know, ending poverty and hunger, providing global child and maternal health care. But notice two of these goals are directly related to the education for sustainable development, the universal education and environmental sustainability. So the UN is approaching these goals from various aspects. So, so how are we doing? You know, how well do our students understand sustainability and some of these issues? Well, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development provided uh, or produced a report back in 2009 called Green at 15? How 15-year-olds perform in environmental science and, and geoscience in PISA. So the PISA exam, which is the program for international student assessment, is something that's given on a regular basis to countries around the world. And you can look this report up online and you can see how various countries fared in this one. But what they found is that understanding of environmental issues by 15-year-olds lags behind awareness. In other words, they've heard about climate change. You know, they've heard about ozone depletion. They've heard about loss of biodiversity. But their understanding of those issues it's not as good as their awareness of it. So it needs to go deeper than just knowing about them. It really needs to go more towards the understanding so that they can, as they grow up, make informed decisions. There was some very good news out of this report, however. There is very strong student interest in and responsibility for the environment. Students want to make a difference. They really care about the environment, e even at 15 and even from, um, from students who are less economically advantaged. And so that was very encouraging that the, the next generation of students really sees environmental, uh, care for the environment as their responsibility. Um, most of the students, uh, the vast majority of them in the OECD countries do have at least a basic understanding of environmental science. However, students are pessimistic about the future they don't see that things are going to get better in terms of environmental quality. And so that's, I think, another area where green chemistry can come in, that many people around the world view chemistry as polluting and destroying the environment. And there is no denying <laughs> that there have been chemical processes, there have been accidents that have led to real environmental damage. But I think with green chemistry, students can be more optimistic because chemistry can be used for good, um, as it typically is anyway, but in a way that's going to be better for the environment. So, so that's very encouraging. Where do students learn, mo get most of their information about environmental issues? Most of it comes from the classroom, from either courses that they're taking, classes in geography or in science, or when they do school trips, outdoor activities, they learn about you know, ecosystems and things like that. Um, of course, media, the internet, not surprising. I hate to tell you this, family and friends are at the bottom of the list.